Uh, first, I'm going to go over an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll go over an introduction and some basic terms about graphs. We'll go over more in depth about network reliability and what it is. We'll talk about the problems with the current approaches. We'll go into our proposed method, then leading into our results. And we'll talk about the applications that we can get from these and potential in the future. If anybody has any questions during this time, please feel free to stop us. So where are graphs? I'm sure you guys know graphs are all over the place. They could be for traffic places and cities. They could be for airline flights. They want to determine what paths planes want to go to get to multiple cities. They could be for Google if they're on their search engine. They have a big complex graph. Or for social networks, Facebook, Twitter, connections, all of your connections. Of course, they are in other places. These are just some basic ones. So what is graph theory? Very simply, it is the study of points called vertices and lines called edges. Here is some simple graphs. As you can see all the way on the left, you have unweighted graphs. The green circles with the numbers on them are obviously the points or vertices. Sometimes we'll call them nodes. And the black lines are the edges. So for an unweighted graphs, each of the edges are pretty much equal. You're not distinguishing between them. Uh, like the second one there, if you see the weighted graphs, so edges can have value to them. They can have distances, costs, times, or uh, in our case, reliability. Uh, you can have undirected graphs where nodes can communicate freely or transport freely in between. It's not directed. And the directed graphs, so they are forced in one direction. Right. Now we're reliability. What is network reliability? Well, a network is basically a graph. The network reliability will tell us Uh, number reliability will tell us um, that given a graph, uh, let's see, such as the telecommunication as a network, uh, how can it withstand a failure of individual components of the system? And there are many models of reliability, such as the edge reliability model. What does that mean? Well, this edge reliability model is a fairly common model. This is where the nodes are assumed to be perfect. They never fail. Only the edges fail. And QE is the fair probability. P is the success probability of the edge. OK. The next model is the classical reliability model. This is also uh, will have the same uh, nodes don't fail, only edges fail independently. Right. And what is the classical model? Um, it, it is the probability that each pair of the terminal nodes is connected to at least an operating operational path, which is successful edges between two nodes, which then form, forms the operating state. And this slide will show you uh, what are the operating states. Uh, on the top is the original graph. And as you can see, as long as all the terminal vertices, which are in dark blue, are connected to a path, there are the operating states. And if they're not connected, they will be the non-operating states, which, in other words, uh, these paths will have to be um, uh, one in one component. As you can see over here, uh, this subgraph is in two components and they are separated, so that would be a non operating path state. All right, I'm going to go over the diameter constraint reliability model. So, a diameter constraint is the max distance that is basically allowed in the graph. Uh, it's a generalization of the classical reliability to make sure the short enough paths connect terminal nodes. So you can't have connections and graphs greater than whatever the diameter constraint is. So you don't want to send a uh, packet or information over 20 nodes, maybe you have a cap at 10. Uh, I'm going to go over oh, first what is an operating state. For every pair of terminal nodes, there exists a path of length d or less connecting them, kind of what I just went over. Now an example for this. Um, if we take this example here, this simple graph, the blue S would be our source node, 
the red K would be our destination, our terminal nodes, so we're trying to communicate between them. Uh, so right there where it says if D equal to 3, we're setting the diameter constraint equal to 3 for this. So for it to be considered an operating path or an operating state, there has to be a path with 3 or less connecting those two nodes. So if you see the blue top path, you can guys count just 1, 2, 3. That would be a success. The green going through the middle is 2, which would obviously be less than 3. That would also be considered a success. But the red path on the bottom would be considered a failure. Can anybody guess why? Because... Yes. Aubrey is <laughs> okay, here is another example of operating states. This one is for undirected. Um, if you see those dark green nodes, those are going to be all the terminals. Um, for our example, we actually only use two, but this is, again, it's just kind of going over a diameter constraint. Um, again, the diameter constraint would be equal to three. So this here would be the original graph. And all these three here would be the operating states. If you can see between any pair, you can always get to it in three or less jumps. So one, two, three, one, two, three for these. But over here, they are connected, but if you can obviously see, one, two, three, four, five. It is greater than the diameter constraint of three, so that would be considered a failing state. Now, how is network reliability calculated? The slide's a little long, so if you have any questions, please stop me. Uh, the most common way is to use an exact method, which is a methodical approach that looks at all possible subgraphs. One of these exact methods is factoring. So what is factoring? If we look at this example over here, uh, like Helen said before, the PE is going to be the probability of success. So we may set it equal to 0.6 for all the edges. So each edge probability of success is equal to 6. Now, to calculate in factoring, first we will select a pivoting edge, which we will be choosing as the red line there. We will then create two new graphs, one with the edge failing, which would be equal, setting it equal to zero, and one with it definitely succeeding, which would be setting it equal to one. So that is what we did here. On the left, you can see we set the new probability for that red line equal to zero. On the right, we set it equal to one. Now, the formula to calculating this, we just came up on the left there. The reliability from the source to the destination, which in our case is k of the graph, is equal to. This is the probability of the original edge failure. So it's, it's kind of confusing. But the QE, so in this case it would be 0.4. So the original edge success is 6, failure would be 0.4. Times the new graph with the edge removed, which is setting it equal to 0, plus the probability of success for the original edge, which you can kind of see down there, it should be 0.6 times the reliability of the new graph with the edge fixed, which would be setting it equal to 1. Um, now, this is going to be calculated recursively until the generated graph is trivial to calculate. So it's pretty much going to look like a binary tree. It's going to keep going down until you get to one of these two conditions, where there is no possible paths from the source to the terminal. So that means there are zeros, and there is no possible way to get to it. It is definitely liability of zero. Or if there is a path from the source to the terminal using only edges that are determined not to fail. So if there is a definite path of one, then you could stop there. Um, and that is with, if it's within the diameter constraint, then we set the reliability equal to one. So if one of those two conditions are not met, so if there's still undetermined edges, the factoring will keep going down. Um, as you can probably see, this is going to be very time-consuming and costly if you have a large graph. So, what is the problem with that? Uh, we use a very simple graph. There's only four nodes there, so it was very uh, kind of simple to explain. Uh, Real-world graphs are going to be much larger, much more complex, and with that, have much more or many more subgraphs. So, as the graph grows, the number of subgraphs is going to grow exponentially. Uh, since in factoring, we generate 2 to the e potential subgraphs, with e being the total number of edges from the original graph. Uh, therefore, this leads to the exact evaluation that considers all possible paths is NP-hard, which is non-deterministic polynomial time hard. Have you guys heard of NP-hard before? I'm sure some of you have, maybe. Basically means, <laughs> at Martin S, he's in our group. Uh, it is a very hard problem that there is no known algorithm to solve the problem in polynomial time. These problems are common and people are very interested in them. Has anybody ever heard of the uh, traveling salesman problem? Same kind of concept. There we go, Mark. Um, so 
once basically once people prove that these are NP problem hards, people become very interested in these problems and trying to solve them or have workarounds for them. Um, basic problems, I kind of went over them, but it's pretty simple. It is going to be very time consuming as the graphs get bigger. And this could also lead to it being very costly. Uh, now some related works where these were originally found. Dr. Lewis Patenji, sitting right back there. Uh, in 2001, the K-Terminal Diameter Constraint Network Reliability was originally introduced by him and his colleague Rodriguez. And in 2004, it was found that when evaluating diameter constraint reliability, this is for five parte graphs, I believe, when the diameter constraint is set equal to two, it can be solved binomial time, all things are good. However, when it is three or greater, it becomes reliability of NP, or to calculate the reliability, it becomes NP hard. So basically, this is where we got the information for the last slide. And in case you didn't know what he looked like, uh, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, now you have to ruin the presentation. <laughs> All right, oh, our proposed solution. Well, uh, in order for us to find a reliability in a more timely fashion, we decided to use Monte Carlo using uh, MPI parallel processing. Now, what is Monte Carlo method? I'm sure some of you would know. All of you should know. No. <laughs> well, a Monte Carlo method is a method that performs repeated random sampling in order to obtain the approximate solution to a problem. This is due to the law of large numbers. If there's a larger sample size, as the sample size grows, the average of the results will become closer to your actual solution. Now, why do we use Monte Carlo algorithm? Uh, like I said before, it's, uh, it's a very close approximation to our optimal solution, and it's in polynomial time, which means it's much faster than the factoring, which is uh, exponential. Now, why did we run Monte Carlo method using MPI parallel processing? This is so that uh, running the Monte Carlo algorithm will be shorn will shorten the computational time further by n number of processor times. Okay. All right. All right, this slide shows our pseudocode for our Monte Carlo using an MPI parallel processing. As you all know, uh, you should first initialize all your variables Afterwards, we created our graph based on information we read from a file, and then we started uh, the timer for each processor because we wanted to see how long it takes to run this trials, launch trial trials. We, for each processor, we have a million trials, so we loop through a million times, and for each um, for each loop, uh, all the edges are determined. <laughs> Therefore, uh, this is determined by generating a random number between 1 and 100. If the number is less than or equal to the edge success rate times 100, then the, set, the edge is successful, else the edge fails. And then once all the edges are determined, we end the loop. Using Dijkstra, we are able to determine if there is a path less than or equal to the diameter constraint. If there is, then we increment the success count. And once all the trials are finished, we end the loop. And once that is done, we end the time. Well, we get the end time for each processor. And thus calculating uh, the time it took for each processor to finish all the trials. Now we want processor zero to show our results. Therefore, we have to pass the information to processor zero. We pass the time of the slowest processor to time our Monte Carlo. We also pass the total successes to processor zero. Therefore, the approximate reliability would be, did anyone know? It would be the total successes over the total trials, which would be 10 million. Mm -hmm. And then we, we will also show the uh, exact reliability, which is um, on this, so as a pinky favor. <laughs> we used his uh, factoring um, this factoring result. Then we calculate the difference, and then we show time at the end. And here is our mean method. 
if you're interested in taking a look. <laughs> As you can see here, we initialize all the variables. This is where we created our graph and read from the file to set up the edges. Over here, we start our time. And this is where we loop through all the travels. We use another for loop in the inside so we can determine all the uh, edges. And then we use NPI reduce, uh, which is a quick way, quick and simple way to get all the information from all the processors to zero. Processor zero. And in this slide, we show that processor zero would display all this information. How many processors there were, how many um, successes there were, the reliability that Marco Polo produced, and then the difference between the actual result and the Marco Polo reliability, and also the time it took to calculate this. Okay, for our results, um, we ran it on 10 processors, 1 million trials per processor, and that gave us a total of 10 million trials. Um, like Helen mentioned, we timed the slowest trial, which we saw in that um, reduce there, the first reduce statement, where it's taking the max. You can see the function FPI max. We're taking whatever the largest time is of all the processors, and we consider that to be our time use for these results. Um, like she also mentioned, we uh, we had a factoring algorithm that ran through the exact method and took all the time in the world. Um, so to save time, we took the results from Dr. Patendu's paper because some of the results took longer than a couple of days. So obviously, it would be kind of hard to us to run that. But they would be the same results that we're comparing to. And they obviously got the same exact reliability. Uh, now, for this 5x5 five five grid. Um, first of all, we chose all of our edges equal to 0.5 reliability. We could have used a formula based on distances. We could have set them all equal to differences, or set them all differently. But uh, just for the purpose of these results, we're trying to see how long it took and how accurate it was. So it didn't really matter what the exact reliability was of each of the edges. Um, over here in the white, uh, on the left, we have all the names of the graphs that we'll be using. That will be the same for each of the tests. This S to T is the source to the destination node, and this D is going to be the diameter constraint. So on each of the tests, we either change one of these or both of these. Uh, the yellow, the factoring, that is all the results from Dr. Patanji's paper. Um, this first column in both of these is going to be the exact reliability that you get. This CPU time is going to be measured in seconds. Uh, in the blue, the Monte Carlo, that first column is our reliability that we got using our Monte Carlo with MPI method. Uh, and the time that it took. And finally, the red column there, the difference in reliability, just shows the differences between these two. So this is going to be the exact, this is going to be the approximation. Our goal with these results is to show that with our Monte Carlo approach, the difference in reliability is going to be so minute that uh, the time saved is going to be very beneficial. So if you look through some of them, um, as you see the CPU time and factoring, uh, it's growing exponentially, just like we said before how it would how it's kind of like a binary tree. But in our Monte Carlo, our time is pretty much identical. It's not even growing at all in some of the cases. That's just because you're running a set amount of trials, so the time should be fairly constant. Uh, if you look at the differences in uh, reliability, they are very close, sometimes a thousandth of a percent close. Um, this is going to be kind of a similar trend here. Now, we also did uh, several other graphs. This one is the dodecagraph. Uh, as you can see, we kept the same source and destination node. The only thing that we changed was the diameter constraint. Again, you can see how the CPU time in the factoring uh, is increasing, but in our time, it is staying constant. And if you can see, it's kind of blurry, but uh, trust me, the results are pretty good. They are, again, within the thousandth of a percentile. Does anybody know what color these represent here? Yellow, blue, red? Columbia is black. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Carbonate. <laughs> uh, this is kind of what the original <laughs> intro <laughs> was based off of. Um, again, kept the same uh, source and destination node. You can kind of see the 0 and 19. Uh, the diameter constraint, again, we changed for this one. Um, I'm sure you guys see the similar trend. CPU time for factoring is increasing um, while our results are staying the same. Um, does anybody have any questions on these so far? Does everybody have more to add on that? 
Um, that's kind of like what the original internet was generally based off of, I believe. We use just several different kinds of graphs just so we can kind of have different results. We don't want to use the oh, same. Uh, Rio, Rio looks like this. What was that? The, the, the network of an Stopped. Yeah, uh, looks like this. Yeah, Alphabet yeah. is derived from the original ARPANET, but actually it's an optical network. And that's the, these are the main nodes, these are the main structure, or there are there, from there there's ramifications, you know, the, okay, but that's, this is an optical network actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we also did complete graphs. Uh, so what a complete graph, does anybody know what a complete graph is? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so it's basically every node is pointing or connected to every other node. So uh, as you can imagine, as it grows, it's going to be very complex. Um, so that's all that the K stands for. So K6, K7, K8 are complete 6, complete 7, and complete 8. Um, if you notice in this one, actually, the first complete 6 for the factoring, the time was actually quicker than ours. But again, their time is growing as the graphs get bigger, and our time is staying pretty much constant. Um, still, the difference in reliability between all of the graphs that we had are pretty similar, and they were pretty good. Can I, can I interrupt? Uh, when, when I ran the original factoring theorem, they used a recursive, uh, you mentioned before, they used a recursive algorithm. They always had problem with the stack, <laughs> because the, the number of calls are billions and billions of calls, of calls that you recursive calls. So, so basically, that's, that's one of the problems that we have with the complete graph after, I was able to run up to uh, nine vertices. After that, it was almost impossible to run recursively that uh, was using the exact method. Uh, and you can see from the time, all the time is pretty much the same. It's under three seconds for all of our results. So as the graph grows, it should not make too much of a difference. Um, I believe this is the last graph we did. It was the circulant graph, where the nodes are connected to neighbors and the node cross on the circle. Um, I don't think I really have to go through everything again. You can see the time growing and factoring, and our difference is remaining low. So uh, me and Helen are going to go over some applications that the Monte Carlo can be used for. Uh, this here is a wireless network um, mesh. You're trying to basically find the greatest area of connectivity. So you have an option to put a transmission node in A or B, and an option in C or D, and you want to find where it is giving you the most reliability. Um, so what you would do, you would place one in A and C, A and D, B and C, B and D, and you would run re your results and try and find what gives you the most reliability. If you see down there, for R and B and D, that gives them the best reliability, so that means you would want to place your two nodes in here. Uh, now, before, how I mentioned, they have simple graphs. This, again, is a fairly simple graph, so you could probably get away with using factoring. But as this gets more complex, you have more nodes, more distances, more things to calculate, you're going... Yeah, one other question, what is QE there? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so as it gets more complex, you're going to want to use a faster approach, which would be our Monte Carlo approach. Um, that QE there is going to be the failure of the edge. Like I said before, how we chose 0.5, there's also formulas that you can choose. So in real world, this is kind of one of the examples of that. So it's basically, you'd have your nodes, you're going to calculate the distance between the nodes, which would be the D. Uh, then the N is kind of the environment, so is it open air, is there no interference, is it between walls, that number can change, I believe it was from 0 and 2. Um, and all the other ones are just other factors that you can kind of tweak, and so the realer your simulation gets, those values are going to change. So it's pretty much just a formula, but when we use our examples, we were not really concerned with that for our case. The next application example is also with a wireless mesh network. Uh, this example shows um, which which node would be the most, um, I guess, uh, the most important towards this reliability between S and T. As we can see here, well, what is a wireless mesh network? It is a communication network that each node relays data for the network. And uh, depending on the distance, the, the reliability can drop because the signal-to-noise ratio, which means that uh, as nodes move further apart, there's more stray frequencies that can interfere with your data transmission. Therefore, 
in the parentheses is the distances and the, uh, the probability over here is the edge probability of success. No, failure. So we can make it to the yeah. <laughs> Over here is uh, 40 distance away, so it's 0.8, so it's even worse. Over here, uh, we get the reliability of between x and k of the original graph. If we minus the reliability of x and k on a new graph without uh, one of the nodes, we can see how uh, important this node is to contribute to the reliability of uh, the original graph. And we did, did it for, well, this example did it for all three nodes. And you can see over here that the second node is the most important because it contributes the most to the reliability. Okay. Uh, what are some other applications? Well, using the administrate reliability, it will give us an indication of the suitability of the distance network topology of uh, good quality voice over IP applications, such as uh, video conference applications. Um, this makes sense because uh, they would have to constrict uh, how many nodes or distance between uh, the terminal vertices. Uh, if there is a large distance between the terminal vertices, then there's going to be a, a large latency. Another application would be um, it will be towards protocols such as TTL regarding packets, time to live protocol. This is in order to uh, avoid congestion by having data looping um, through the network without having it uh, to terminate. This allows, um, this assigns a maximum number of hops per, uh, for each of the data, the data packet so that the uh, so that if it's unable to reach its terminal or its destination within a certain amount of hops, the data will be uh, destroyed. And also the dynamic constraint on reliability, which is the complement of the dynamic constraint reliability, will give you the probability uh, that Due to failure of the links, there are some nodes in the network that are not reachable by using these protocols. And this is a useful information because um, in order to reach these protocols, um, uh, administrators would want to use different protocols to have a longer uh, hops between uh, for the, each package that uses these nodes so that the nodes would receive their data. And this is our conclusion. Our initial results show that the results of Monte Carlo with firewall processing uh, to test the reliability of networks are much more time efficient while only having a slight uh, minute um, inaccuracy. And um, for our future works, uh, regarding wireless networks, uh, we're currently in the process of using um, NX2, which is a network simulator. This would help um, us because we want to correlate our results of reliability with the um, simulator's throughput, which is the number of packets it receives by the sink, which is the destination, over the number of packets generated by the source. This would be uh, like a real-world um, network simulator and would further like, validate uh, our results. Um, another improvement is to use Monte Carlo. Um, it's a modified out of Monte Carlo uh, to use Ocean and parallel processing. Um, the system we have here is a distributed memory system, which means that um, underneath, when we are performing Open Shannon on uh, these systems, it will be using MPI. Therefore, um, Dr. Loomis, <laughs> beat us to the punch, he created an uh, OpenShim version of the Monte Carlo and tested it on this system. And it shows that the OpenShim was a little slower than the MPI version. 
but we use it on a real shared memory machine. Uh, the open shaman should be faster because uh, open shaman uses a one-sided communication library where individual processes do one-sided uh, puts and gets, uh, as opposed to MPI, which uh, does synchronization uh, between sends and receives between pair of processors. This means um, that the open shaman allows for data to be sent without having to wait for the remote nodes to do uh, communication. Therefore, uh, open shaman should be faster once we test it out on a real shared memory machine. And next, um, this method could also be used to improve uh, networks. For example, we test uh, network reliability by relocating nodes around to get the optimal range to increase the reliability. If we use the uh, exact factoring uh, approach, it will be too time consuming and expensive to uh, get the result on time in a timely manner. Therefore, using Monte Carlo with par parallel processing would help um, generate these results much faster, and thus allowing us to complete, uh, hopefully, this test much faster as well. <laughs> These are our references, and that's pretty much it. Anybody have any questions? Any questions? Or double questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay.